Hello guys, welcome to a new video. Today I'm going to be talking about some basic digital colouring techniques. I wasn't planning on making this video, it's a bit spontaneous, but I received some requests to record the colouring process of this drawing and also I've had some questions lately about my blending techniques with digital art, so I thought I would combine the two into one and make a little tutorial-ish video, kind of like my line art one. So I hope that it will be useful to some people. So I'm going to be using Paint Tool Sci for this, but pretty much everything I'm talking about can be applied to other software, it's just that the buttons will not be in the same place, so you might need to do some exploring. So I'm most familiar with Sci, it's more comfortable for me to use, so it's what I'll be sticking with today. And I'm going to be showing you how I do two different colouring techniques, which are soft shading and cell shading. And it's probably not like the best quality cell shading, I call it that, but there are people who do cell shading a lot better than me. It's just a technique that I use that I find quicker than the soft shading. So I'll show you the difference. So if I get this picture of cinnamon here, this is my soft shading technique. This is my standard technique and it just involves blended colours with no real hard edges. And that's my usual technique, but it does take longer. And then this is my cell shading technique, which takes much less time and you can see it's got the harder edges on the shading there. Or you can combine the two, that is always an option, so for my poster here I did kind of combine soft and cell shading. I like the effect of both, so it's, it's really up to you, I'm just sort of more used to doing the soft shading now. So I'm going to show you a little bit of both and maybe it will help you to sort of get started with digital art and then from there you can build on and develop your own sort of unique look to your colouring. Okay, so you should have your line art all done and ready to colour here. If you haven't got to this stage or you're not confident with your line art yet, I'm just going to be shameless and point out my line art tips video, which is linked up in the top right corner of this video, and hopefully that will help you out. So the first thing you'll need to do is make a layer for each part of your colouring process, just to make things easier. You can either keep all your layers separate or do what I do and make a base layer and then put all the other layers as clipping layers on top of that. But either way I will be showing you how to select parts of your drawing and how layer modes work and so on. So the first thing I like to do is make a layer that's just a plain flat colour and that serves as a base for all the layers that will be going on top of it. So. If you're new to the concept of layers, basically they work like acetate, so they're transparent and then when you add something onto them it doesn't affect the layer below it. And you can link layers, you can keep them all separate. There are a lot of options but hopefully I can simplify it down for you to get the hang of quite easily. Because when I was younger I was really scared of using layers, I didn't really understand how they worked. So I'll just explain the, the basics of them and hopefully you can get the hang of them more quickly. So the first thing that I like to do before I start properly colouring is make a layer that's just dedicated to being a base for all the other colours. So I make a layer that's just a single plain colour and then build all the others on top of that. And what that does is help me in the long run by stopping me searching for gaps and filling them and fixing them as I go through the rest of the colouring process. So what we're going to do is select the line art layer. I've actually been organised for once and I have put my layers into a folder and named it, which usually I don't and then I just have no idea where anything is. So I've got this selected and what I'm going to do is get the magic wand tool which is just over here on the left hand side above the brush window and I'm going to select outside the character and then I'm going to choose all these little bits and then unfortunately because I've got a load of gaps in the line art at the bottom it's not going to select those. So in my line art video I did say try not to leave any gaps in your line art but it's not a huge disaster, it just takes us a bit more time to fill it in. So then what we're going to do now that we've got a selection on the outside of the character, we're going to go to invert on the selection menu up at the top and that will select the inside of the character. Now if it's easier for you, depending on the way that your picture is put together, you might find it better to select the character from the inside, if that makes sense. But because I've got no background on this illustration, then it's easy for me to select the character from the outside and then invert the selection. So whichever way is easiest for you. And then what I'm going to do is make a new layer just underneath the line art layer and I am going to choose a colour which is quite dark, I usually use a dark blue for this just so it shows up nicely against the background and then just fill it in. And the shortcut for filling is Control F on Psy by the way. And then I'm going to deselect or clear rather, on site it's called clear, just under the selection menu. And so we have most of this filled in, but then what we need to do is still fill in the rest. 
So if we just go in and check that there's no gaps here, which there shouldn't be if I select it from the outside, but you can never tell. And then what I'm going to do is just fill in all this excess at the bottom. It's because I moved my line art slightly when I was moving the picture around and rearranging things, and so I've pulled the line art slightly away from the bottom of the page. So that was my own fault there. So just going to fill this in right up to the edge. So that's done. So now what we have is a layer that is filled right up to the edges of where we want our colouring to go. So we've got this and then what I'm going to do over here on the right hand side we've got preserve opacity and I'm going to click that and what that does is it locks the pixels on the layer so you can't accidentally go over them and mess anything up if you click on the wrong layer because I do click on the wrong layer a lot. And then from there we are going to make a new layer and clip it to that layer. So just next to preserve opacity we have a button called clipping group and if we click that you can see that a little red line appears next to this layer indicating that it is now clipped to that one. And what that means is that when we draw something on this top layer it's not going to go outside the limits of the one below it. And that's something that I only discovered after I've been doing digital art for quite a long time and I wish I'd discovered it earlier because it's so useful. But from here we can now build up different layers for each part of the drawing. So what I'm going to do is just get a colour for the skin. It doesn't really matter if the colours aren't right because you can always change them afterwards. But then we'll make a layer for the skin, then we'll make another for the hair, then we can use another clipping group, and from there we will just fill in each part of the picture. And you can use your stabiliser if it makes it easier here because I actually use the stabiliser quite a lot for the hair. So you can see just here, to get those nice tapered points around the hairline, then that's really useful. And from there, just start building up all of your colours for the different parts of the illustration. And I'm going to fast forward it so you don't get bored because it does take a little while. But once you've got that not very exciting part done, then we can move on to the exciting part of actually adding shading. Okay, so here we have the flat colours for each part of the drawing on separate layers. Don't be overwhelmed by the ridiculous amount of layers I have going on over here, I always have too many layers. So the first thing I like to do before I add any more detailed shading, and I do this on both my cell shading and my soft shading, is to add a multiply layer where I just throw down a general indication of where my first shadows are going. So I'm going to make a new layer just to use as a demonstration for this, and I'm going to do a quick sort of squiggle across the image here. So this is on normal mode, so it's just plain red, but just over here above the layer window we have a box called mode, and under here we have all the layer modes. Now most software has these in pretty much the same place. This isn't a video about layer modes, so I'm not going to run through the whole lot, that would take a while, and you can explore them by searching for them online or just trying them out yourself, but I will just do a quick rundown of the ones that I use. So firstly we have multiply, and multiply is named after the maths that it does on the layer, so we're not going to get into maths. But basically, Multiply removes lighter parts of the layer. If there's a mid-tone, it blends it with the colours below, and black remains black. So if I add some black here, it still stays black and opaque. If I use white, it's like an eraser because it just disappears. Whereas that mid-tone red remains where it is and just has an effect on the colours underneath. They're all tinted red. And so that is really good for adding a unified shadow across the whole image without losing the intricacies of your colours underneath. So for example, if you need to add a purple shadow, but you don't want to lose the depth of colour on the rest of the image, you can do that across the whole thing and it kind of really unifies the image. Next we have overlay. 
And what overlay does is has a multiply effect on the darkest areas. On the mid-tones it has slightly less effect than multiply, doesn't darken them as much. And on the lighter areas it screens them, which means that it brightens them up. So this is really good for adding contrast. So if you add a colour overlay layer onto your image, it will tint it that colour but also boost the contrast. And then the last one that I use a lot is luminosity. And as you can see, that takes out the dark areas and the rest becomes lighter. Luminosity basically brightens up everything. There is more to it than that, but essentially it makes everything brighter and disregards the darker parts of the layer. So it's like the opposite of a multiply layer. So I would say try not to overuse luminosity, even though I do use it quite a lot. I try to keep it only to small highlights and things like bright lighting in the background or highlights on metallic parts of the character's clothes and things like that. So those are the three that I mainly use and for this first part of the shading I'm going to be using a multiply layer to just add a general idea of where my first shadows will go. I've just thrown down some quick colours in the background because like I said in my line art video it's best to avoid working on a completely white background if you can. Firstly it's harsh on your eyes, secondly it can impact on your perception of colour and thirdly what I would recommend is trying to work from the background to the foreground if you can. So if you have a detailed background on your illustration, it's probably best to colour that before you begin to work on the characters and then you can figure out what colours from the background are going to be impacting the colours on your character. So obviously if it's a warmer background, then there's going to be warmer tones working into the tones of your character. In this case, I don't know what I'm doing with the background on this illustration yet. It's going to be an abstract one, but I haven't quite decided what I'm doing. So as a sort of compromise, I've just thrown down some vague colours that will be kind of the final colours, I just don't know what the design will be yet. So for that reason, I would recommend having at least some form of colour in the background that is similar to the final colours you're going to have there. So then moving on from your background, you then want to think about where your light source is in your illustration. If your character's outside, there's going to be light sources everywhere, there's going to be reflected light from the sky, everything's going to be bouncing off and it's going to be quite diffuse. If your character has a lantern or a torch on them of some kind or they're using magic, think of how that's going to bounce off of them in very high contrast. If they have light coming from below, that can have... Think of the way that people tell scary stories with torches under their faces so it highlights the bottom of their face. That can have a sort of stereotypical evil look, uh, but it can of course be used to denote good characters as well. They could be using magic, they could be standing over a pool of lava. If you have light coming from the top of a character, it can have a, a spiritual effect of some kind. It can portray that they are good, that they are lawful. But again, all of these rules can be bent and they're not solid things that you always have to abide by. It's just something to take into consideration. And so I already decided when I was doing the line art stage of this drawing that the light was going to be coming from above. And you can see that in the way that I have done the darker lines on the line art under his nose and chin and so on, because the light would be coming from the top. If the light was coming from the bottom, I would have emphasized the lines on the top of him more thoroughly. So I'd already considered that earlier, and now I'm just going to start working on that. So what I'm going to do is make a layer above all of the color layers and set it to multiply. And then I'm going to choose a colour to work with. There are tons of things to consider with colour theory and colour use and again I'm not going to go too deeply into that here, maybe I can do it in a future video, but I'd say the key thing to remember when drawing characters is that when you have a warm light source you're going to have cool shadows and vice versa. So here is our light source coming down and from there we are going to have cool shadows going up. I don't know why that's sad. Thank you Seagull for your input. So here we now have warm highlights coming down and cool shadows are going to be bounced upwards on the character here from the bottom. And that is very important to bear in mind. It will add a sense of realism to your image and it prevents your shadows from looking very dull because a lot of people I think start out using just grey for their shadows and you have to remember shadows still have colour and so does light and it's all about building in those little colours to add subtle variation and really bringing your character to life that way. I think we can just stop the video here because this guy right here is the pinnacle of everything I've ever drawn and I don't think I can improve on it but sadly we have to delete him and move on to a multiplayer layer. 
So, like I said, light source from the top. There's going to be warm light coming from the top, and so I am going to choose a purplish colour for the shadows. So, just moving around my colour wheel, having a bit of a debate. And I'm going to choose a brush, and what I use is all default brushes. I do not use custom brushes very much at all, even in Photoshop. In Sai, it is a little bit more difficult to add custom brushes because it's just a complex process. But also, I find that if I use custom brushes, I spend more time fiddling and debating about them and changing the settings than actually drawing anything. So I just use completely default brushes, and so I thought that's why it might be a good idea to make this video, because then I'm not introducing any sort of complex concepts for you guys. I'm hoping that it's nice and easy to follow because I'm just using the very basic tools. I changed the density quite a lot because obviously the opacity will vary depending on what part of the picture I'm drawing and how deep I need the shading. But the rest of it I generally keep mostly the same. I really don't change settings very much, which I probably should, but I just like to get on with the drawing and not fiddle with the software. So yeah, that's just what I'm using right now. So if you want to use the same thing, then there's uh, the options for you. So what I'm going to do is just make this brush really big and then just work over because I've got my multiply layer above all of the other layers that are clipped to the base layer so it's going to affect all of them. The difference here when using layer modes is that when you apply a layer mode to clipping layers it will affect everything below that not just the layer you've selected because they're all classed as being connected together. So again something you've just got to play around with and figure out what works best for you. So I'm just working up from the bottom and making a very, very general indication of shadows. And then if I don't like it, what I can do is just lower the opacity on the eraser and take some of it back out again. So I want the focus of this illustration to mainly be his face. So I'm really trying to blend out the body out of focus of the viewer if that makes sense to kind of get those shadows deep enough the viewer's eye is not drawn to them so just gonna kind of do a vague idea of shadow placement over here just to start me off and then once I've done that I usually lower the opacity on that layer so it really doesn't show up that starkly against the colours, it just gives a, a first layer of faint shadows for me to then work from. So then what I'm going to do is go down to the first layer I want to work on, which is the skin in this case, and I am going to eye drop the colour of the skin. So just above the brush there is a little button called colour picker or eye dropper and that just allows you to pick up the colour that's there. And from there, I am going to then choose a shadow colour. And try not to keep always going towards greys on this side, on the colour wheel, when you're picking colours, because you don't want your image to be washed out and desaturated. So I'm just going to choose a shadow colour. Again, colour saturation, hue, and all the different variance in the colours that you could pick is not something that I'm going to go into today because it's just too in-depth for me to cover in this because this video will end up about an hour long otherwise and so I'm just going to try and keep it to the basics but maybe in the future I can do a video on colours. So then what I'm going to do is just start to work in the areas that need to be in shadow. And you can adjust the density you can adjust the hardness, you can, if you take the blending down then it means that it won't pick up as much colour that's already on the canvas and so it's like having less water in your paint in a real life equivalent. So just play with the settings as you go and just put down your basic shading. Sometimes I do mock-ups of traditional illustrations on the computer because then if I decide I don't like the colour scheme then it doesn't matter because I haven't ruined the traditional piece with these colours that didn't work. Bear in mind the contours of the face and 
fill in the aspects that your line art didn't. So there's going to be details you didn't fill in with your line art because it would have looked strange, it would have looked like too much, but you can fill in that detail then with your shading. So then once you've got some basic shading down, always remember to save. So then once we have got some basic shading down, get the eyedropper again and eye drop a colour in between the two where your colours are meeting. Then you can start to blend it out like this. It's something that you learn over time, where to place the sharp edges in your shading and where to make the edges harder, but I'd like to play around and create variations. So don't make all of your edges too soft because you'll create an overly airbrushed effect and that's something that I would highly warn against because you don't want your artwork to look so well rendered that it actually looks plastic. And then just get a darker colour again and keep building up those shadows. Remember variations in your shadow colours so don't leave it to just variations of the main tone that you're using. Bring in different colours. As a general rule, the zones of the face have different colour tints to them, so around the eyes tends to be slightly more purplish. Think of when you're very tired and you get marks under your eyes, they can start to look like bruises because they're quite bluish purple. Around the nose and the ears I tend to make the colours slightly more red, not so much that it's obvious but just very very subtle, and around the forehead it tends to have a slight green tint. There is huge variation in skin tones, it depends on the character's race, it depends on the environment. There are whole books dedicated to just this and there's one book I recommend which is called Colour and Light by James Gurney and that is really good for learning colour theory and lighting on characters and environments so I definitely recommend picking that up if you can. So again I'm not an expert but generally that's what I tend to do to try and add in some variation. So in the deeper shadows I will go towards a more purplish blue tone keeping in mind that my highlights are a warmer colour. And you can see it adds much more interest to the piece rather than just keeping to that very limited palette of using just the brown. You can use the sliders just underneath the colour wheel. Along the top of Psy you have an option to change the way that the sliders are presented below the colour wheel. So you can change what you have on view there and you can change your hue and saturation sliders along. So this one is really useful, the RGB slider. And so we can move our colours slightly more towards blue without having to work our way around the colour wheel. So that's quite handy as you're shifting your colours while you work. So just keep going like that, put in your shading and then blend it out, figure which areas you want to have a harder edge on your shading and which areas you want to be more subtle and blended, but just try not to over render because that will look fake, it's not going to give the character a nice texture. This is especially important on skin and of course all different types of clothes will have different textures as well so you want to create variety between them. I'm not doing this as thoroughly as I normally would so that you guys aren't sitting here for three hours watching me, but I'm just going to show you how the overlay layers can come in with adding those different tints and shades into the colour here. So I've just used an overlay layer with a purple colour under the eyes. So you can see if I do it like that he looks very, very tired and that is precisely the way that I draw the shadows under Jacob's eyes because he just looks like that 24-7. Then I'm going to add a slight red tint to the nose and you can see how that's having more impact on the darker areas of that layer rather than the mid-tones. And I also add that usually to the ends of the ears and to the chin a little bit as well. It's all personal preference. You will, obviously there's, there's rules and guidelines but the, a lot of aspects of people's art styles are down to personal preference. So that's just those extra tints added in and then I'm going to lower the opacity so that they're not quite so bold and that just adds a little bit of extra interest into your colours. And then finally I'm going to go for a luminosity layer to illustrate the use of highlights. With highlights on the soft shading I still use the brush but I turn the density up so that it has a sharper edge and then I'm just going to show you here how I would illustrate that. So 
bearing in mind, light source from the top, luminosity on his nose there should actually have been in a cooler colour because that's actually bouncing up from the bottom of the image so that was me being stupid and you can always use the water tool to blend it out if it's too stark and there just add that in you can use a lower opacity you can try different strokes like this I usually use a few lines like this on the character's cheeks you could use dots like this to indicate skin texture it's really down to you what kind of technique works for you and your style but that's just a really rough guideline of how I would use my soft shading technique and then if you also have bounce light coming from the bottom of the image what I sometimes do to add a little bit of extra dimension is make a normal layer and then just brush on some pale blue onto the bottom very subtly just like this and that will just give a little bit of extra depth try not to overdo it you don't want it to be too contrasting but it can really give the emphasis of the character being within an environment and not just stuck on so that's also good you can emphasize that and use a brighter blue for example if a character is standing above a pool of water or in the sea because you've got reflected light coming up then but yeah just play around with it and have fun and experiment so next I'm just going to quickly show you my cell shading technique the cell shading technique is quicker because it actually looks more effective without so many levels of shading and highlights so strictly speaking cell shading should stick to mid-tone shadow and highlight but for me I tend to add an extra layer of shadow into the darkest areas so it's not really strictly a cell style but you know we're just going to call it that for now so what you're going to need for that is the pen tool or the ink pen whatever you prefer and make sure your density is on 100 and you can also use the stabilizer for this if it helps you I do talk in depth more about the stabilizer in my line art video if you want to know more about that so for this I do use the stabilizer just to make sure I've got some nice smooth lines and then above my skin layer I'm gonna make a second layer here a multiply layer and I'm gonna use a dark bluish purple again and then I'm gonna go in and start adding some shadows and this is gonna look slightly alarming at first as you might have seen in my video where I drew Jacob for my talk about art styles it's a little bit OTT at first but we are going to be reducing the opacity on this later it's just so you can clearly see what you're doing and because we're not really going to be blending any of this out I think you do need to consider more carefully where exactly your shadows and highlights are going whereas with the soft shading your knowledge of shadows and highlights doesn't need to be quite as strong and thorough because you can make it more subtle as you go Whereas this, it's very bold and very dynamic. So just consider more carefully where exactly your shadows are going. Okay, so we've got the basics down here. So then I'm just gonna lower the opacity and you can see that because of the nature of the multiply layer, it starts to blend more naturally with the color underneath. So it is a bluish tone shadow, but it doesn't look quite so contrasting against the brown skin tone. So then it's up to you whether you would like to add another layer of shadows. So then I'm going to make another multiply layer and just go into the darkest areas, pick a slightly darker blue and just pick out those particular areas where the shadow will be darkest. You can soften down some parts of your cell shading if you like. For example, I tend to blend in a little bit around the temples, but don't overdo it because then obviously that will defeat the point of it being cell shading. It will just look like soft shading. So just do selected areas and allow them to blend in a little bit with the rest just to add some variation there. And then the last thing I do for my cell shading is make a luminosity layer for some nice sharp highlights. So I'm gonna pick a warm yellow again and just go over the same place as before, but you can see because I'm using a pen instead of the brush, it actually comes out as a much brighter color because the opacity is on 100% and it's got all these nice sharp edges on it. 
So again, we can blur them out slightly. I would actually suggest using an eraser more than the water on luminosity layers because the water can make them look a little bit strange. It can sort of blend them out in the wrong way. But this is just a general idea here. So try not to overdo it with these highlights. Just add enough to give the character some depth and bring them to life. And if you like, you can reduce the opacity, just experiment. You can see the color coming through slightly more there as you lower the opacity on the luminosity layer. So up to you how bright and dynamic you want it to be. So that's just a rundown of my two most used coloring techniques. Like I said, I sometimes do combine the two. I can create soft shading with some distinct hard edges to add contrast and that can be really effective. And you don't have to use the layer modes if you don't want, they're completely subjective, that's just the way I do it. After using digital media for quite a few years, that's the way I've settled on doing it. You can also avoid using the base layer, you can just separate all of your colours into a separate layer and not connect any of them or lock any of them together. That's up to you again, that's just what I do. And just explore and have fun, and remember with digital media, there's no risk of making a mistake. You have the freedom to experiment and that's what I really love about it. So yeah, just have fun and play around and see what happens. And I really hope this was useful to you. So please do let me know if there's anything else you'd like to know, any details, any specifics, or if there's something else you'd like me to discuss in a video. I'm not sure how good my tutorials or explanations are, but if you would find them helpful, please do let me know if there's something else you would like to see on this channel and I'm really grateful to you for stopping by and taking a look. A few people actually asked to see the colouring process of this but I didn't think it was enough to really warrant putting it in a video by itself so I'm just going to include it at the end of this tutorial. So feel free to stop here if you were just here for the tutorial bit but I will be talking about it a little bit more while I show the time lapse. So I really hope you enjoy watching it. Here's another quick bit of advice, as well as using overlay layers and just brush tools and pen tools and that kind of thing to change some individual colours on your drawing, you can use the hue and saturation sliders. So if we go into filter along the top you've got hue and saturation or brightness and contrast, then you can use those to play around with the different parts of your drawing. So there's advantage again of using all separate layers for different parts of your illustration. So in this case I'm going to dark and his skin tone a bit and then I can just adjust that without affecting anything else on the image. I realised that I hadn't mentioned either in this video or in the line art one who this character actually is, but this is my first proper drawing of my D&D character. His name is Taran Adark, he is a wood elf and he's also barbarian class, but he's not looking very barbarian like in this picture because I wanted to try drawing him in some more traditional wood elf style armour, hence he's not looking very comfortable because it's not really what he wants to wear but I just thought it would be fun to experiment and I am going to be drawing him in his more traditional barbarian clothes in the middle of raging in some other pictures so just for this one he looks a bit smarter than usual. There's not a lot I can really say about his backstory because obviously campaign stuff but in personality he's reckless, very short tempered, he tends to see everything as a personal insult, he gets himself into a lot of stupid bar fights, he's chaotic good but verging slightly on neutral 
and he's very small. He's got a serious case of small dog syndrome. He's like five foot three, and so he's about a foot shorter than some of the other people in the campaign, and he's quite bitter about it. So that's another thing that kind of fuels his very short temper. And he's got absolutely no manners, and he doesn't really do politeness, no matter who he's talking to. And yeah, he's just quite rough around the edges, but at heart he can be very loyal, but it takes a while to get to that point where he actually trusts you enough to give you any loyalty. So yeah, that's pretty much all I can say for now, but I really do love him already. So as you work, remember to add texture and variety to your drawing. You can do this with custom brushes, I just didn't mention them because I don't tend to use them very often, but if you enjoy using custom brushes then you're welcome to experiment with them to try out different textures. For this illustration the armour is not metallic, it's leather, so it's got a kind of diffuse scattered light on it and there's no particularly high sheen spots on it. I just made a luminosity layer above the whole image to add some shine to his ear piercings and a little bit on his armour, but for the most part it was quite diffuse. So I just added some scattered highlights on his skin and leather armour with a plain brush tool. I did use a texture overlay for the circle in the background, that was just a plain paper texture and I experimented with different layer modes on that and saw what worked. I'd probably recommend not overly using textures, as in don't become too reliant on them. It's nice to be able to figure out how you can represent textures on your own and kind of replicate them and compromise and figure out a way that works with your style. So for me, even though I'm working in a cartoon style, I do like to have a degree of realism and being grounded in terms of adding variation and texture, because you don't want your drawing to look too uniformly shiny or plastic, because then it will start to look a little bit fake. You want to add interest and you want to keep the viewer's attention, and as they explore the image they want to see different varieties in textures and materials, so just kind of work that in as you go and experiment and have fun with it. So here is the final image, I really hope you like it. It's going to be available as a print on my store and at upcoming conventions as well, but I will make a video about when I get my new stock in for my shop. And I hope this video was useful to you. I know it's a little bit long because I tend to be a bit rambly on these videos, but hopefully it was useful to you. Basically I'm just making the videos that I needed when I was 15 and I was new to digital art. So if there's anything in particular you'd like me to focus on, do let me know and I'll try to put a video together for it. And thank you for stopping by to watch this one. So I hope to see you next time and thank you for watching. Bye!